and solar systems, um, how they can work together, and how you can uh, work them into a hybrid system to make your system more reliable. Today, we got uh, Ken Kodalik with Primus Wind Power to help us out on this presentation. Um, Ken has been uh, working in the wind industry for a very long time and uh, is going to help us out and uh, show us how they can be complementary and uh, how the uh, solar and wind work together uh, without issues. And uh, in the background, too, we have Kayla helping us out with questions. Um, as always, please answer, uh, ask your questions in the chat box and the uh, questions box. And uh, also, this webinar will be recorded. It will be up on our website within about 24 hours. Um, if for any reason you need to uh, jump off for a call or something else like that, or if you've gone too quick and you missed something, want to review it again, you can always go back to record a webinar later to uh, catch up on whatever we missed. Uh, my name is Rob Rollo. I'm a senior engineer with Sunwise. Uh, I've been in the solar business for about 28 years now. Um, and mostly in the uh, off-grid business. So um, I've got most of my experience in the off-grid, not the on-grid, but the off-grid uh, battery-based uh, systems. Sunwise has over 20 years in the uh, off-grid business with uh, standalone PV systems, hybrid systems like we're talking about now, and uh, battery backup or battery-based systems in general. We've got uh, facilities, and uh, we've got facilities mostly on the East Coast and West Coast, uh, based out of uh, Oregon and, and uh, California on the West Coast, on the East Coast out of New York, and we've got uh, sales offices throughout the country. So I mentioned we provide uh, standalone PV systems, hybrid systems. Uh, we can also do call cycle charge, which is a CDC system, battery backup systems, custom modules. Uh, we can also do custom control assemblies for you as well. We can do those to ISO 9001 or UL 508A if needed. Uh, we can also do um, other value added services. And uh, always, as, as always, component sales. We can do tradition sales too. If all you want to do is buy the parts and put it together yourself, that's more. That's uh, that's fine. Um, in terms of engineering and support, we can do uh, consultations. We can help with spec writing, um, design engineering. So if you need help designing your system, we can do that. Certainly these hybrid systems are a little more complicated, so we're happy to be there to uh, help you in that effort if you need it. Um, we also can follow up with the troubleshooting training as we're doing now and other services like that. So with that said, I'll let uh, Ken go ahead and introduce himself. Uh, good afternoon from Flagstaff, Arizona. This is Ken Kodalik from Primus Wind Power. Can, Rob, can you hear me okay now? Yep. Great. Um, I am the uh, sales and operations manager for our company. And as some of you may remember, the air turbine uh, was, we took over from a company called Southwest Wind Power back in January of 2013. We produced these products in uh, just outside of Denver, uh, Colorado and we've been doing so now for over five years but the turbine has been around for quite a long time and uh, so I'm happy to talk to you about it today okay uh, just a brief overview of what we're going to cover today so we're going to cover um, how the wind and solar can work together to improve the reliability of your system um, and I think that's a that's a pretty important feature how the two actually work together so how you can integrate them and have them work together without issues what additional materials might be required, and then we're going to go a little bit into uh, height, re um, height recommendations, site considerations, and things like that. So with that being said, I will let Ken take it from here, and Ken, you should have control now. Great. Thanks, Rob. So what we do is we do hybrid systems. So we're combining solar and wind together to make that battery bank happy. As you can see from this illustration, the solar and wind are both inputting two charging sources into the battery. Two charging sources for a hybrid system is important because when the sun isn't shining at nighttime, when there's weather conditions, when there's low sun periods like in the winter, you have that secondary charging source to keep that battery bank uh, happy. So that's the, the idea of a hybrid system. So here's your standard uh, hybrid wiring diagram. You can see the, the solar on this side through a charge controller your ammeter, your battery disconnect, your breaker into your battery bank. On the wind side, working simultaneously in symphony with the solar system, charging that same battery bank, you have the wind turbine going through a stop switch. We highly recommend a stop switch so you can shut that turbine down as needed for maintenance, um, potentially very high wind conditions if you're away from the, the 
a turbine for a period of time, uh, going through a fuse breaker, uh, battery disconnect, and so on. Um, very simple uh, system. All the controls for the turbine are up tower in the nacelle or the body of the turbine. So all those up tower controls are there. There is no down tower controller. You do not run the turbine through the PV charge controller. Um, all you really have down tower is, like I said, the stop switch, fuse breaker, fuser breaker, batter disconnect. You can um, set up a diversion capable controller and a dump load. Um, if you are interested in that, there's a way to do that. We have that outlined in the manual and I can also talk to you more about that. Uh, uh, or you could talk to Sunwise as well about how to do that. So when you're considering a turbine, there's some things you gotta think about is obviously the tower. Uh, we have multiple tower options. Um, Rob's gonna talk about those, but um, the higher you go up in height from the surface roughness of the ground, um, i.e. trees, buildings, etc. Um, the better off you're going to be. As you can see from this diagram, just going from 10 meters to 14 meters, you're going to get potentially a 20% uh, power increase in the output of your turbine. That being said, the air turbine series, the family of air turbines, is a micro turbine. You know, with your approximate retail cost of a land turbine around 900 bucks um, for the turbine, it doesn't make sense spending you know a thousand or more on a tower. So the sweet spot for our turbine is somewhere between 30 and 45 feet. The tallest tower we manufacture is a 45 foot tower. And many of our oil and gas applications, um, industrial applications are on very short towers, sometimes as low as 12 to 15 feet. And when you're in West Texas, Oklahoma, North Dakota, and the surface roughness is minimal, just the cows walking around and such, you, pro, uh, the, you really don't need that tall of a tower, especially when we're talking about supplemental additional power to augment your hybrid system. So just keep that in mind when you're, when you're discussing, when you're thinking about your tower. More importantly, what you should be thinking about is really siting. And uh, here is uh, a diagram for siting. And you can see here uh, that the best place to put this turbine is here on the prevailing wind side of this building. Um, any object that's gonna cause turbulence you wanna try to avoid. So that's why this location for the turbine behind the building is gonna cause uh, turbulence. Rob, I think you're, uh, you uh, unmuted yourself or somebody did. Um, so uh, this is the, uh, not the best location so over here would be a better location uh, for that turbine on the prevailing wind side, obviously, if the wind is coming in from this direction. On the water is a great place uh, for wind, obviously, because you have zero surface roughness on the water and you have these great laminar flow lines. Turbulence is the killer of wind power, so you wanna try to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, up a hill is a great spot. That's why you generally have higher uh, velocity on the top of a hill. As you can see, as the laminar flow moves up the hill, those laminar flow not lines begin to compress, which increases velocity. Um, on a plateau, a cliff, a mesa, or a building for that matter, you will have uh, turbulence caused by the vertical faces of this uh, plateau, mesa, or building. So that's something you got to consider uh, when you're mounting turbines in those areas or doing a building mount. So that being said, we do have a building mount kit, uh, but you will get, you will not achieve the full power curve uh, from the turbine if you have that kind of turbulence off the vertical faces. We do have a number of customers, many customers, maybe 10%, 20% of our customers who do mount the turbine on their energy shed, their barn, their small outbuildings because it's an easy and expensive place to mount it. But Remember, the turbulence will diminish the power production of the turbine. So keep that in mind. So we're going to talk about the solar wind solution, this hybrid system. I have a solar on my house in Flagstaff, Arizona. I love it. It's great. But it does have some drawbacks um, in an off-grid system. One of the drawbacks is it has your lower output during the winter months. We also have diminished output during inclement weather and uh, no output at night. So wind power is uh, much better uh, during those conditions because the average wind speed is higher during the winter months. 
We know that. We'll show you some examples of that. Air density is higher during the winter months, and air density is part of the wind power equation. As we can geek out for a minute here, which I like to do occasionally, you can see the three factors in the uh, power of any wind turbine. One is air density. Wind velocity is the most important. You can see that's cubed. And then the other one is swept area. Swept area is how big that blade set is, the rotor diameter of the blade set. Our swept area of our wind turbine, it has a 1.2 meter, that's about 46 inch rotor diameter. It is a micro wind turbine. So swept area is key to the wind power equation. Uh, excuse me. Wind power on average is stronger during bad weather periods. So when there's weather, there's wind, that, that kind of does hold true. Um, and then wind does frequently blow on those long uh, winter nights. If you've ever been in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming in the winter, you know that to be very true and also many places across North America. This is, uh, this is a diagram kind of illustrating this point of, of the hybrid system concept, which many, many um, systems are moving towards these days. Grid tie and off-grid systems are moving towards hybrid systems. And again, it's because in the summer, lots of sun, not a whole lot of wind. But in the winter, that's the exact opposite effect. You have more storms. You have lower daylight hours. Um, so, the, And the wind speed is much higher in the winter months, um, especially in North America. So this is a wind resource map. The darker the blue color, the, the better, the higher the wind speed. So you can see here in the middle portion of the country that um, – that there are you know excellent winds that's why you have the industrial those megawatt those two and three megawatt size turbines in the middle portion of the country one good reason for it coastline obviously along the coastlines you have good wind here are your mountaintops and uh cascades rocky mountains and so on sierra nevadas so the mountaintops all have good wind around the great lakes right the water um the zero surface thrusts of the water on the east coast so lots of good places for wind. So how, how do you really know what your wind speed is at your location? Because that's the most critical thing that you need to determine. Well, we have a great tool through Primus Wind Power and Sunwise, as well as able to uh, utilize this tool um, that um, through AWS True Wind, it's um, 200 meter resolution data as low as a 10 meters. That's 33 foot tower height. 200 meter resolution data means that we, you pick a point anywhere, uh, you give us a point, an address, a GPS coordinates, decimal data coordinates, and that point is, uh, we get the data from anywhere from 200 meters from that location. So it's very specific data, which is what you want for your site. And how do you do this? Well, you send me an email, you send an email into our info at primuswindpower.com. You go to our website where there's a, um, a location for determining your wind resource right on the home page or you can contact one of the Sunwise representatives and, and then they can also um, let us know to uh, provide you a wind resource assessment. We'll just need your, your name, your email, and your, again, your address of your off-grid site, your decimal data coordinates, or your GPS coordinates of your site. Here's kind of what the uh, um, site resource um, assessment will provide. Um, you're gonna get the monthly distribution January through December of your site. And remember what we're looking for is um, winter wind speeds. And if I can, sorry, go back for a second and remind you that the recommendation we have is four meters per second or greater. That's about a 10 mile per hour wind uh, for a minimum for a hybrid system. So here's my house in Flagstaff, Arizona. Just for fun, I did a resource. This is at 14 meters of tower height. That's 45 feet. And you can see not a great wind resource. I'm averaging under four meters per second, a little bit better in the, in the, in the winter months. I might be three, uh, 3.8 or so in the winter months. Um, so this would be, you know, a difficult judgment call whether I put up a wind turbine at my house or not. I also have a lot of big trees. But this is the location where I put the turbine. That little pin um, is where we put it on the map. That's the location you give us. And you, you can see I'm fairly open to the prevailing wind direction. And the next slide I'm going to show you gives you, this is a power rose. It's similar to a wind rose, but it tells you the predominant power direction of the wind. So most of the power in the wind is coming from the southwest. 
that's really what you want to know is where's the power from the wind coming from and that's how you can help site your wind turbine so in the southwest direction here i have a little better resource um, with less obstructions less turbulence but i do have quite a few trees i want to show you this next site this is Mosier island in maine and you can see a much much better wind resource here well over that uh, minimum four meters per second or greater this would be a very good site this is at 14 meters of tower height 45 feet 45 foot tower when i lower that tower height to a 33 foot tower you can see 10 meters here you can see the wind um, the wind speed came down a bit from um, to below five meters per second from above five meters per second so i'll go back to this one 5.21 versus 4.82 right so you can see tower height makes a difference um, and in this case, you have really good wind in either one of those towers. You could probably go down to a 27 or 20 foot tower and still have very good wind at this site. Um, you also have to consider siting, right? So here's your power rows at this site. And you can see it's all over from south to north, um, predominantly out of the northwest direction here is the predominant wind direction. And you're open to the south, northwest here because of the water. So just wanted to show you that's kind of what you would get in your wind resource assessment. And it's important that you get that so you know how to site your turbine and you know that you're a good candidate for a wind turbine. So that's a very important question to, to ask is, you know, what is my wind resource at my site? And so here are some actual complementary curves for um, three different locations. And this is using NREL data, 30 years of NREL data from the 250 or so NREL sites across the country. I picked three locations. You can see the most pronounced here is Billings, Montana. You can see that, again, that complementary curve of wind and solar. Again, in the winter months, lots of wind, not a whole lot of solar, but the opposite effect in the summer months. So uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Fargo, North Dakota, a little less pronounced, but still you see that, that complementary nature of wind and solar. We also, as you guys know intuitively, the solar day is very different from June to December, and you have much more sun hours and sun intensity and, and, and many other factors um, from June, the summer, to December. That's why in off-grid systems, uh, Sunwise would size your system for you know the shortest day of the year, the middle of December, if you didn't have a wind input. But if you have that wind input, that secondary charging source, you're able to change that sizing paradigm because of the fact that you have a wind turbine in the mix and you know you're going to get amp hours into your battery bank at night, during storm periods, during the winter months when the sun is, you have less sun hours. So critical, critical ideas there. Uh, critical components for um, sizing a system. Sorry, Rob, having trouble switching the slide here. Um, if you could, there we go. Thank you, Rob. Um, so here is a Trojan brochure of why hybrid systems are better. Uh, they make, recommend a maximum of 80% Trojan batteries, that is. Trojan recommends a maximum depth of discharge of maximum of 80%. When, when Rob and others at Sunwise would size your system, they would say 50% should be the sizing uh, maximum DOD um, and for a, um, uh, to keep your battery life within a reasonable range. But if you have uh, a hybrid system, remember, you can likely push that depth of discharge, reduce that depth of discharge, and maybe only go down as much as 30 or 40 percent and you can see the curve here between cycle life and depth of discharge is much steeper so you get more cycles out of that battery bank if you don't deeply discharge that battery which happens frequently during storm periods or during winter weather or at night right so the idea is here is if you keep that battery happier if you keep that depth of discharge low for flooded lead acid batteries, sealed or unsealed, um, 
of lead acid batteries, then um, you're really doing your batteries a big service and you're getting more cycle lives out of your battery, therefore saving you money. So again, secondary charging source is a good idea in a hybrid system. Look, just, just a little bit about the air product line. So we've been around a long time, 25 years, starting with the 303. Some of you on the call today might remember these 303 and 403 turbines back in the 90s. And then we moved to the AirX in the 2000s. Um, and then it, we became the Air 30 and the Air 40 with Southwest Wind Power around 2011. And then just a couple years ago, we introduced the Air Silent X with the blue blades, um, the very our very quietest turbine. So if you're looking for a quiet turbine, that's the one to go with. Lots of authorized service distributors all over the world who can work on the turbine, provide parts, etc. cetera. Um, and this turbine has benefited greatly over the years through multiple generations of improvements to the circuit card, to the design of the turbine, to the blade set, and so on. So been around for a long time. Here is what the turbine looks like. There's the air. This is the land version. It's a cast aluminum, our basic finish. All of our land turbines are gray. All of our marine turbines are white with this uh, aircraft quality, marine grade, corrosion resistant paint. Um, all of our marine turbines come with some stainless steel components inside for the marine environment, as well as a stop switch. The land turbines don't come with a stop switch, but I recommend that as an add-on because you always want to be able to shut that turbine down again for the reasons I outlined earlier. Here is those blue blades. They can be retrofitted to any of our turbines, even turbines from back in the day, right? The old Air X's and so on. So um, we have a retrofit kit and uh, several kits to be able to uh, put these quiet blue blades on any turbine, especially it makes a huge difference on the old Air X's, uh, which can get up well over 100 decibels in sound output at high wind speeds. These are um, as, as little as 30 decibels um, and really make a huge improvement to the old black blades. Here is our air power output curve, and the uh, blue is the Air 30 Air X Marine, and the uh, red is the Air 40 Air Breeze. Um, and you can see here, just from a power standpoint, because the Air 40, the Air Breeze, is designed with a little different blade set, it will outperform the Air 30, the Air X, at the lower wind speeds. And then you have this big jump right here because of the RPMs of the turbine of the Air 30 Air X turbine. It's designed to spin at 1800 RPMs versus 1200 for the Air 40. So that's what this big jump is and where you get over 400 watts. So the, the, the takeaway is that if you have a low, low to moderate wind speed environment and you want low sound, then the Air 40, the Air Breeze is the way to go. Or if you're on a cruising sailboat, the Air Silent X with the blue blades is a good way to go. If you are an industrial application, you have a high wind speed environment, such as an offshore oil and gas platform, a buoy platform. If you're in a very high wind speed environment like West Texas or North Dakota, the Air 30 or the Air X Marine is the way to go um, because those are designed for to optimize that high wind speed environment and uh, to do well in high wind speed. So that's the kind of the difference between the turbines. Um, a great thing to do is take a look at these uh, webinars and YouTube videos and things that we have on our website under the support tab. If you are considering buying a turbine, I would recommend that you go to our uh, my longer hour-long webinar that goes through operation, maintenance, installation, looking inside the turbine uh, as well uh, for uh, really to understand the turbine, how to install it, especially if you're installing it yourself. So those are really good things to do. Also, there's videos on cleaning and basic maintenance. If you have an air turbine and you need to replace the circuit, we have videos on that. It's relatively easy. And then troubleshooting for any potential issues there might be. So with that, I'm going to switch back over to Rob. And thank you very much for your attention today and listening. And I will be available for questions as well after the uh, webinar. Thanks, Ken. I appreciate that. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what additional materials are required for your wind machine to work. As uh, Ken mentioned, 
Um, you have the wind turbine, but you do need a few more things for that to, to, for, for it to uh, work in an integrated hybrid system. Uh, so one of the things you're going to need is you're going to need a regulator to go with that. Uh, you're going to need a disconnect of some form. Um, Ken's mentioned stall switch a few times. Uh, an install kit and tower kit. We're going to go into these in a little more detail. Start with the regulator. Actually, the regulator on the air machines is actually built into the machine, as Ken mentioned. It's actually inside of it up on the pole. Um, so that's where it's located. Uh, it does not include the temperature compensation. Just to let you make aware of that. So when using it in these systems, we generally recommend that the voltage, uh, the regulation voltage for the machine be a little lower than the solar um, so that the solar can do the finish charge and make certain the batteries do not get overcharged um, in the summertime and things like that. So we do recommend that, that, that the air machine be used for a bulk charger and that the finish charge should be done with the solar charge controller. Okay, um, so as Kim mentioned, the stall switch is really important for being able to work on the, mach the wind machine. And um, anytime that it's not being used, it's good to go ahead and, and do that. What happens is the stall switch actually shorts the uh, plus and minus wires to the machine causing the blades to not move. Uh, that then makes it safe to climb the tower, work on it, or if you can lower the tower, even better. And again, work on it and not have to worry about these blades spinning. Um, also, if you're worried about extreme high winds, you can do this so that you can prevent it from, uh, uh, even though it has safety precautions in it, it wouldn't hurt to have additional precautions so that it can't overspin. Um, so these are the things that a stall switch can do for you. Now, it can also be used as a junction box, a disconnect, and a troubleshooting location. And here are some examples of uh, stall switches. We have our own at uh, Sunwise that we have developed. Uh, ours is in a corrosion-resistant NEMA 4X enclosure. It also includes a shunt for measuring output current. Um, you can also, uh, it also has a ground bar for a grounding location and includes the overcurrent protection. Um, so it includes circuit breakers for that. Um, and some also some terminal box uh, as well in there and uh, at the stall switches we just mentioned as well. Okay, now we also have an install kit. It's pretty simple, but it does include some very important components and includes your output cable. Uh, you remember, you need three conductors for this. You have a, a plus, a minus, and a ground that comes out of the wind machine, so you need to make certain that you have all three of those. Okay, and the output cables on that are only about, I think, 24 inches or so. That's not going to get you very far down a pole when your pole is uh, 30 plus feet in the air. So you need to make certain that you uh, connect to those wires um, so we have an inline splice terminals, which are pretty cool. They're not exactly butt splices. They actually have uh, screw connectors on them. It's a pretty neat thing. So we have those that go along with the uh, six gauge, three connector output cable, as well as also some cord, grip, cord grips and other miscellaneous parts. So that's what's needed for the install kit. And then of course, the last other part of this is the tower. There are several types of towers. There's a lattice or truss, there's a standalone or a pole, and there's guided mast. I think the guided uh, towers are probably the more, more common ones. Um, let's see, the uh, lattice and truss are generally more climbable, uh, can be assembled on site. They do require concrete though, because you do need some type of, uh, you basically need a, a base for that. So, and again, that's gonna require, because of that base, it's gonna require a large footprint. And sometimes it can be also done as a guided tower as well. If, um, if the base isn't that wide, you may need additional support with guide wires as you go up. Uh, the monopoles uh, or standalone are uh, sometimes more attractive. Um, you'll see a lot of those uh, used um, with the uh, cell tower type of thing. They do not require guide wires. Um, however, um, it's hard to go high with those uh, because of that. There are limitations to that. And it does require, again, extensive uh, civil works underneath to make sure it doesn't blow over. So the guided towers are the most common because they're relatively inexpensive, easy to raise and lower, can be assembled on site, and again, require... Um, now, do you require a large footprint? The actual spot where it attaches is small, but remember, you have those guide wires coming down. So when you look at that all together, it may end up being a larger footprint as well. But if you're thinking of actual points to the ground, it may actually be smaller, depending on how you, you uh, view it and think of it. So along with the tower, if you're going to have a guide tower, you have to have guide wires. Uh, and um, there are various types of uh, anchors that can be used, and they uh, are dependent upon the soil conditions. Um, you've got an auger, duck bill, you can bury it in concrete, and then you have a, uh, an eye bolt with cement as well. So there are a couple of different options here. 
Um, let's see where I mentioned that. So the augers are generally kind of a screw-in type. Um, then you have the uh, the duckbill, um, which is also like an arrowhead with a wire cable. They're driven into the ground so that the arrowheads are parallel with the surface. Then the concrete's pretty obvious. You just set set the set set it into the ground with rebars, eye bolts, and things like that. And then oh, pins also known as rock anchors. Um, if you got a really rocky site, I haven't seen this for a while, but we've actually done that with some solar systems as well. If you got extremely rocky sites, you can actually uh, set up uh, rock anchors or pins to uh, secure things, whether it be a uh, whether it be the uh, wind turbine or even uh, the solar array pole. Um, and again, uh, different types of anchors are do better in uh, different conditions. Um, this is just kind of a, a little chart here. You've got uh, for loose, uh, for sandy type, you might be better off with uh, a concrete or buried type of anchor. Um, for um, gravel, loom, clay, rocky soil, air, the uh, arrowhead's good for all of those. Um, an alternate would be the uh, the concrete. And then you start getting into uh, rock type of, of uh, um, uh, rock type of uh, soil and conditions, uh, you might want to look at, start looking at expansion bolts or some type of rock anchor. And if you got any questions on those, again, feel free to contact uh, Sunwise or Primus on those. Okay, so um, with the towers, we have uh, four standard kits that you can order. We have a 29-foot easy tower kit, and that includes everything. We'll go into that in more detail. That even includes the poles and everything. Then you've got the 45-foot guided tower kit, and that's just the, uh, uh, does not include the pipes, but does include the uh, the fittings, uh, the um, uh, anchors and stuff like that. 27 foot, and then we have a nine foot, which um, can be used for um, your sailboat and things like that. It's, it's a, again, it's designed to be marine, so it's designed to be attached to the boats. I do not recommend that for land use. It's going to be kind of short, but uh, it's there if you do have an application for it. So, as I mentioned, the 29-foot easy tower kit includes everything. It includes the poles, the earth anchors, the guy wires. does not require any civil works um, at all. So this is kind of a neat kit to try to, uh, to uh, uh, keep it simple and include all the materials. Just, just kind of a quick picture of it. You can see it's got the base uh, there. It's got uh, two different guide wires. It's got the upper and the lower. It's got the guide wire attachment plates. You've got a bunch of cable clamps. Um, if, again, you've got various lengths of tubing or uh, pole for that. Um, it's also got some uh, earth spikes. Okay, the 45 foot um, tower kit does not include the pole or the anchors in this case. Uh, it includes the tower base, the guide wire kit, and the tower setup kit. So if you have if you um, have conditions where uh, these anchors don't work for you here. Um, then you can uh, perhaps want to go to a different kit and where you can provide your own anchors and your own pipe. Um, especially, uh, it does get expensive to ship pipe, so this might be another good option as well if you can get your pipe locally. The uh, 27 foot is exactly the same as the 45 foot. The only difference is uh, that um, it's just shorter, that's all. So you're going to have a, a little bit less, uh, I think you have a little bit less of the. Uh, uh, connector points because it's a shorter tower, so I think you have uh, one less connecting point or something like that for the wire, so you don't have uh, as many levels or layers on that. But again, it's the same thing, just a little shorter. Okay, the marine kit uh, requires, it's actually in two pieces. This one gets a little, little tricky. It's in two pieces. It's the nine-foot marine aluminum set and the air marine tower hardware kit, okay? Um, so it actually ends up being two pieces. Um, and it's designed for attaching the sailboats, as I mentioned before. It does include the mast or the pole, the stays, vibration dampening mounts. Again, if you're on a sailboat, that's going to be good. Uh, and it's stainless steel hardware, again, because it's from a marine environment and uh, other pieces needed for that. And here's an example of it on a sailboat. And you can see, you can see the uh, white body on that. So that's going to definitely be uh, one of those marine grade uh, wind turbines. Although it does have the, uh, the black blade, so it might be an older model. Okay, so just to summarize what we've discussed now, we've got, uh, uh, just to reiterate, wind and solar resources are very complementary. I think Ken's done an excellent job of showing that. Okay, the air units work 
very well and easily with the solar systems. Um, and again, just to reiterate, they're actually these systems are actually um, working separate and autonomous from each other. One of the ways this makes it more reliable is just that, that if for some reason the solar system were to fail, you have the wind there as a backup because it's a completely separate charging source and vice versa. So one of the, that's one of the things that makes it more reliable is the fact that these two systems work independent from each other. They have the same battery bank, um, but the charging sources act completely separate and autonomous from each other. Okay, um, again, and simple wiring connections uh, from the air directly to the batteries. Again, um, you've got those three wires coming out. You just need the uh, extension cabling, the connectors, and, um, and the stall kit. Uh, the wind turbine, again, it bulk charges the battery. I want to reiterate that. It does not have temperature compensation. It doesn't have, you know, the three or four stage charging you've gotten used to with the pulse of modulated solar charge controllers. Um, so you're not going to get that absorption charge and uh, um, equalization or anything like that. So keep that in mind that you want to um, have the solar there. This is, again, this is where the solar can be complementary. You can have it there to do your finished charge to make certain that your batteries, um, you know, get fully charged uh, properly. Okay, um, and as Ken mentioned, it's going to work best in those high wind zones where you have an average of uh, four meters a second or better. Okay, so that's where you're going to get the best output out of it. Um, let's see. And uh, don't forget that besides just the wind machine, you've got your you've got your pole, your stall switch, your other installation components. And uh, refer to the siting guidelines for best placement, as Ken's taught, mentioned before. And uh, feel free to come to us or Ken for um, you know, for the resources about the wind at your site. And as Ken mentioned, it's very important. Just don't give us a city or a zip code. Giving us um, as accurate a location as possible through regards, with regards to an address or coordinates is going to really help a lot. Um, I mean, you can be in a town, which can be huge. It could be like 20 square miles. And, um, you know, it can include a valley or a hill or all kinds of stuff. And that can make a huge difference as to whether you're going to get good wind in that zip code or not. So the more accurate a location you can give us, the better wind data we have to let you know whether uh, wind would be a good option or not to add to your solar system. So um, we also have many tech notes. And uh, further information, as Ken mentioned, we've got uh, Ken has a whole bunch of additional information on the Primus. Uh, wind power website uh, with regards to maintenance and other things. Uh, we've got tech notes on this. As a matter of fact, uh, Kayla just finished up the tech note, um, which goes into just this. It goes into um, how wind and solar are complementary and help to make your system more reliable. So we just have a new tech note on that. Um, and of course, this this webinar and other ones from both us and Primus are available on our on our uh, websites as well. Um, It'll, so again, if you miss something and want to go over it again, please feel free to uh, catch the recording of this and um, review whatever was said. And if for some reason um, you think of a question at that point, feel free to email us or contact us. We'd be happy to answer questions even after this webinar. Uh, let's see. And uh, don't also forget our engineering bulletins as well. Just for tech notes for additional resources on, and information. So with that being said, um, let's see um, if everybody has any questions. Um, I'm not seeing any questions on our end. I would like to, uh, Rob, if you don't mind, I'd like to clarify just a couple things that, uh, between your between your presentation and mine, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. So Rob refers to the the switch as a stall switch, and I refer to it as a stop switch. Sorry to be confusing there, but really what 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 we're talking about here is a way to shut down the turbine and it's a stop switch on our end because you're not pushing amps into the battery bank you're stopping any amps flowing into the battery bank for a potential overcharge but it is a direct short to the windings uh, electromagnetically it's an electromagnetic brake it is not a mechanical brake so a mechanical brake would actually stop the blades from spinning and what we're doing is actually stalling the blades because in high winds the blades will still continue to spin they just won't get above the 400 to 430 RPMs needed for the turbine to uh, actually start um, activate and push amps and start the, the stator from pushing while they see through the uh, rectifier. So uh, that's kind of why we, Rob and I refer, you know, differently to it stop and stall. I actually like Rob's term better, stall switch, 
but uh, so I wanted to clarify that. And then also I wanted to clarify something Rob was talking about regarding the turbine is a bulk charger. It is simply on or off. You're either getting amps, depending on your wind speed, or you're not getting amps. And uh, and again, that's where all the finesse charging from the solar comes in. Um, and, and, and the turbine is always looking at battery voltage in the circuit card. So when it sees that battery voltage is at for a 12 volt turbine or 12 volt system, pardon me, 14.1 volts, um, then it's actually gonna shut down. Um, and then when that battery voltage drops below, 5% below that 14.1, it's gonna start back up again and give you whatever amps is dictated by the wind, right? If you're getting max wind of you know 35 miles per hour or something, you're gonna get max amps. So, or you know lower amps depending on the wind speed. So again, that's what the turbine is doing. It's a bulk charger. It's designed to supplement that solar system. It's designed to help during winter, during weather, during periods when um, you aren't getting the input into the solar panels. And one other thing I wanna mention since we have a little bit of time is that I get this question a lot is, it's a bright sunny day, but the wind is blowing, um, which is not you know uncommon, right? So, so you have the solar panels, pushing amps into the battery bank, increasing that voltage, um, and then the wind is blowing, but the turbine is gonna be stopped. It's gonna be in regulation. It's gonna see that the battery bank voltage is high, so it's gonna stop the turbine from spinning. But people sometimes think the turbine isn't working properly, but it's working just fine. As soon as a load comes on under that system, um, or it goes behind a cloud, or the, the sun goes behind the cloud, or it's nighttime, then that battery voltage will drop again and the turbine will automatically activate. So you always know what the turbine is doing because there's an LED light on the belly of the turbine that flashes or is on solid. And this is all in the manual. I also talk about it in my longer webinar, but that LED light indicates what the turbine is doing. So if you're ever confused about what the turbine is doing, take a look at that LED light and you can get an indication of, of what it's doing. So just Keep that one in mind. Some people don't, didn't even know that there was an LED light on the belly of the turbine <laughs> until I pointed it out to them. So, it, you know, you, you do you do need to know what 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 happens with your turbine. Reading the manual or taking the webinar is important when you uh, have a wind turbine. So, and thank I you, Rob. I just want to have, clarify that. Uh, sorry about that to interrupt. Uh, we have three questions that came in. Um, the first, the Terry Tomei asks, "What is the price range for an average system for a homeowner?" Um, okay, Rob, do you want to take that one or myself? Uh, go ahead. I mean, I think I mean you know what the retail prices are for this. So let's assume it's it's a uh, the a, a, a regular wind machine retail price, along with uh, let's use the easy tower kits includes all the pieces and parts of that, plus the stall switch and you know maybe a little bit extra for some miscellaneous wiring and stuff like that. So right. Um, so so the turbine itself, like we said before, for a land unit is about nine hundred bucks. Then you have the tower kit, which is another 600 bucks approximately, and then you have the other parts and pieces. So you're under 2,000 for probably closer to 1,800 or so for the various parts and pieces and wiring needed. Uh, that includes the wire, um, depending on the you know the stall switch that you get um, and that and that box. What is that box that um, that stall switch box with all the breakers and everything in it? Cost Rob retail? Uh, I. Th I think that's around 400, I think, or something like that, roughly. It's, it's a few hundred dollars. Let's call it 400. That was, you're about right, though. It's under, right? It's right around 2,000 or a little less, I would say, retail for this. And uh, again, this is just the wind side of it. It doesn't include the batteries and does not include any of the solar portion. Correct. Okay, and we have another question from MD Edwards. Um, he asks, what power levels do, um, we, uh, do we offer in the, the wind turbines? Okay, so uh, the voltages are 1224 and 48, and then the output or the, the rated power of the turbine is depending on anywhere between 200 and 400 watts. So it's a micro turbine. So again, it's a small wind turbine, 1.2 meter rotor diameter, 46 inches, supplementing a, a solar system. Usually these systems are designed, these, this turbine is designed into a system that's relatively small, uh, not 
for a whole house. It's not grid tie, it's off grid only. Um, and so it is a supplemental system. We see again, a lot of oil and gas, a lot of parking lot lighting, um, railroad. small power railroad. Yeah, lots of power, small power systems, uh, off grid sailboats, small cabins. And again, it is not for powering up your typical 1500 kilowatt hour a month uh, residential home. This is a small, uh, small battery bank based system. And I'd also like to remind people, this is, this is, I know this is really confusing. It even confuses me, but just remind people, you actually get more energy out of the 200 watt unit than you do the 400. So even though the 400 has more power, when you look at the actual energy production, the energy production from the smaller unit is actually greater because it puts out more power at a lower, um, at a lower wind speed. And a higher power at the higher speeds actually than the four than the 400 watt unit does so don't just go by the power level look at the energy production from the unit and you'll find in most cases actually a 200 watt will give you more energy generally than the 400 watt unit right that's a good point thanks rob for bringing that up rated power is really misleading um the only reason why the wind industry does that is because they try to uh, get you to understand that verse because you have rated power in solar panels right but rated power doesn't mean anything. It really, what makes sense is you look at your wind speed, your average winter wind speed in this case for a hybrid system, and then you plug that wind speed into the power curve. And then you under, can understand what kind of power you're going to get out of your wind turbine. And Rob is right. The Air 40, the Air Breeze um, are going to produce more power at their lower wind speeds because that's the design of that turbine. It's designed for a lower, wind, lower to moderate wind speed and environment um, versus the Air 30, the Air X, which is designed higher RPMs, higher wind speed environment. So um, again, a lot of this stuff is in my longer webinar as well if you want to understand uh, the, the right turbine for your particular wind resource. And as we always, feel free to contact us for help on that as well. Okay, so we had one final question from Terry Tomei again. Um, it's not quite clear. Um, I think he's asking for the average customer who wants the turbine in a tower, what would be the lowest price and the best value? Okay, good question, Terry. So so um, the guide tower kits are your best bang for your buck, right? Because, and the 27 foot tower kit is the easiest to install, easiest to tilt up. It only has four guy wires versus the 45 foot tower kit. Um, which has eight guy wires because it's a it's got two guying locations. Uh, the 29 foot um, uh, tower kit is more expensive, quite a bit more expensive because we're shipping the pipe and lots of connectors because you have to keep it under nine feet to ship it a small package. Um, so the best bang for the buck is the 27 foot tower kit and then a land turbine. Um, if it's if it's less than 10 miles from the ocean, you can go with a land turbine. And uh, those are the most affordable. The Air 40 turbine is probably uh, what we sell the most of because it's our land turbine. It's quiet and it's got um, good power at the low to moderate wind speeds. So I hope that answers your question, Terry, on the best kind of the best value. I'm not seeing any other questions. Okay, we'll give people a few more minutes in case they have any other questions. Um, in the meantime, I want to I thank Ken for helping us out with this webinar today. I hope it was uh, informative for everybody um, as to how wind and solar do work well together and how they can improve the reliability of your system. Uh, just remind some people of our upcoming webinars. Uh, we have one coming up on fuel cells next month in May. And we're also going to uh, redo our webinar communications. It's been a while. I know it's been coming up quite a bit. People have been asking a lot about that. So we're going to go ahead and update our webinar on that. We're going to do that again very soon, I think, at the end of May. So we have a couple of, uh, couple of ones coming up next month. Um, this one's going to be it for this month, though. And um, let's see. I guess if there are no other questions... Uh, I guess we'll wrap it up. And again, if, 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 if you do think of any questions, feel free to contact us and we'll be happy to answer them um, by email or by phone. And if you have any, uh, if you need help with sizing the system or if you're not certain it's going to be appropriate for application or not, feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to try to help you to decide uh, which air machine would be better for your application 
or if any at all. Um, you could be in some place which has horrible wind resources, in which case it doesn't make sense to to do this. And uh, we're we're um, we're happy to do that. I mean, if, if we're not going to push a product just to sell something, if it's not going to work for your application, we're happy to let you know that's not going to work, and then I'd be spending money on something that's not going to actually help you with your ability system. But if it is, um, it's it's a it's again, if if it is going to work in your location, it's a great uh, economical way to improve the reliability of your system. And as Kim pointed out, not only can you improve the reliability, it can also extend the life of your batteries by minimizing the cycles on it. So uh, if you're in an area with, with, with even moderate wind, this is a great way to improve the reliability system. And it, it, it could theoretically even pay for itself if you extend the life of the batteries by several more years, because batteries are quite expensive now. Uh, they can be as much as 40% of the cost of your system. So any way to extend the life of those is going to be of value to you. Okay, well, thank you again, everyone. Thank you again, Ken. And uh, we look forward to uh, everyone on our uh, on our next webinar. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Sunwise.